Well, I'd like to welcome our next speaker. This is uh, Christine Borgman, Professor of Information Science from UCLA, who's going to talk about challenges of data sharing and reuse of data in three different contexts. Um, the data sharing and reuse in interdisciplinarity or interdisciplinary scientific collaborations. The challenges of heterogeneous practice. Christine? Yeah. I will take the time then to say that uh, after Christine's talk, we will have a little break. And we've made it a little longer this time. And there will be coffee and cake served outside here. And after that, we will have our first Skype meeting and our only Skype meeting. Uh, then it will be Richard Sayre that will be joining us um, from, from Stanford University. And I think that we will have all the technology in order. It's worked well so far, so please help me cross your fingers, because this is always, okay. this is the time when I start shaking. That's when we have people on Skype. Um, but I'm really, really grateful for, for all the help with the technology that we get here from Hip Media, who's filming and who is helping us with the sound. It seems like everything is up and running. So, Christine, Super. the floor Thank is you. yours. Thank you. Good. Um, I offered to give something um, arguably a bit more pragmatic and less theoretical, particularly nice building upon Miles as a, as a contrast, and yet I hope building upon a number of the different examples and building on Lisa and um, Nancy's earlier one as far as some of the science and engineering collaborations. Um, our work is funded uh, as in the last five years or so from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. I've had funding from National Science Foundation, uh, Microsoft and others to do this research over the last 15 to 20 years. And we have been studying the way that people make data. What are their data practices? Can they share it? Can they reuse it? And particularly, can they reuse data from any other sources, data they did not pick up themselves? Part of the driver for this is these big policy uh, frontiers the European Union has been as strong as anyone has as far as requiring the deposit and release of data on the grounds that other people can reuse them, you can promote reproducibility, you can get greater leverage in the funding of research, uh, more openness to the public, and so on. But it turns out to be extremely difficult to do. People today have been talking about uh, the lack of uh, understanding of common theories, common models, common methods. Uh, in our world, it starts with uh, you know, just basic understandings of data. So some background is just the different stakeholders on the campus. When you want to think about sharing data, uh, who do you start with? If you are in the library, and this is certainly the way a lot of the funding agencies would like to think about it, is that uh, the starting point would be that, I'm trying to keep this from falling on the floor, okay. Um, the starting point would be anywhere, okay? That's, it's a really a virtuous circle, the idea uh, you do research, you store it, you share it, it keeps on going. Um, this never actually really happens, but it's certainly the ideal goal. Uh, this is yet another one. If you are in the funding office of the university, do you see any data sharing in here at all? No, the assumption is you get a grant, you execute the grant, you file the report, and you close it out and you move on. Okay? So it's not even in the life cycle. Okay? So uh, here's you've got a lot of stakeholders who are pushing for and away from the whole process of data sharing. We have been asking questions about what are your data uh, since about uh, the year 2000, maybe even a little earlier across many different disciplines. And that turns out to have a much more head-scratching response than you might imagine. People have all kinds of stuff, but at what point does that stuff rise to become something they would consider data, much less something to share? Those policies from individual funding agencies rarely even define data. They say, deposit your data, but it's up to you to decide what parts of it are actually notably need to be deposited. 
This is where I ended up in the, the 2015 uh, MIT Press book was a much more phenomenological definition to say that almost anything can be data. The slides we've seen, um, our shoes, the air, the lights, the temperature in the room, the time of day, we could draw any of these things in depending on what we're studying and being data. Much of what we see is the differences in, uh, in say, signal to noise between the different collaborators. And we have many, many examples, and I'm just going to draw on three here as a way to really draw out what happens when people work together and they think they're talking to each other, but they're really not uh, as much as you might think. Uh, this is one that I used in yesterday's opening keynote for the data theme uh, and you know, developed it much more fully. This was a 10-year National Science Foundation Science and Technology Center that was deliberately interdisciplinary. Uh, perhaps the first of the science technology centers NSF funded that was primarily from computer science and engineering. It's usually more the physical and life sciences that get them. About two-thirds of the participants were computer science and engineering. They wanted real-world problems to build new scientific tools. The incentive for the scientists was to get access to somebody who would help them build new tools. And uh, we can talk over coffee about the difficulty of finding common ground, of, of where the asymmetries were and who was serving whom, which seemed to vary, uh, vary over time in different ways. But uh, really, a number of people were about sensor networks, some were technologies, some were the scientists. <coughs> I used this slide uh, yesterday. A few of you here were yesterday as well. And this is one of a, an engineer who was studying uh, the networks and very interested in getting consistent, reliable data from one day to the next, one hour to the next. And if the sensors were uh, running reliably and he could calibrate them, they, did, they talked a lot about ground truthing, then he had data. It's something he could trust. Somebody else on the same team who apparently been trying to convince the engineers this problem for a couple of years before we had talked to them, uh, does not trust this other guy's data at all. Because in his field, you've got you know, international standards, things like the co-data standards, around how you calibrate instruments and the, the kinds of degrees that they have to work with. Uh, and so he couldn't publish in his journals with the data from this one, and this guy didn't care about that level of accuracy to publish in his journals. One of the things we saw is that the data went off to very many places and different journals, even when they were working side by side. Um, this slide, which we developed um, about 10 or more than 10 years ago already, is uh, probably the best example of the signal to noise differences amongst these groups. So this is, say, being out in a field where you've uh, a natural reserve site up in the mountains. You've got uh, fr a freshwater lake and people trying to look at the concentration of uh, particular nitrates and nitrites in the lake to look for algae. Because if a certain kind of algae takes over, it completely um, consumes the lake. And this happens in salt water as well and you get this big die off. It does terrible things to plants and animals. The sea lions will, will have neurological damage, are killing their young. Tens of thousands of fish will die. I mean, it's a very big problem in water areas. So it's a reason a lot of science gets thrown at it. Okay. The part in the middle, these are the kinds of variables that were data to everyone. Okay, that, that was the kinds of things coming off these networks. The people who were doing uh, the science, the biologists, the oceanographers, were uh, also dipping samples out of the lake, centri you know, centrifuging them, uh, b balancing the pH and so on, and then comparing those to what came off the sensors. They didn't trust the sensors until they had that data. The uh, proprioceptive data, this is the robotics people over here on the other side. Uh, they were repurposing weapons algorithms for science to see if they could hit their target. Okay, can they predict where that algal bloom is going to appear and flip? 
They didn't care about what was in the middle. That was simply calibration data to them to see where, where to send the, the rudders on their boats. These people over here were information theoretic electrical engineers, and they wanted to know about the health of the network. They needed what was in the middle to be able to assess their network. They didn't care about the science either. Okay. So this was maybe two weeks on the ground working together. At the end of the day, all of those groups took their data home, stored them separately, publish them separately, you could never bring them back together again. So the whole idea of reproducibility is sort of not in this kind of environment, despite the best intentions of everyone. Okay. Now here's another example from a group we've been studying since about 2012. Uh, this is another National Science Foundation Science and Technology Center. This is the other, this is dark energy that's not the dark energy the astronomers think about. Okay. Uh, this is the undersea darkness, and it's, uh, they get DNA samples, but they can't put them in the regular public databases because this is DNA of creatures that have never been seen before, and there's nothing to match them to. Okay? So they have a different kind of calibration and reconciliation uh, problem. No two people we've interviewed have come up with the same description of their discipline. Okay, they don't even agree on what they are, and it's all these hyphenated long strings of, I'm a bi biological chemistry oceanographer, something or another. Okay, it's, it's amazing what they think they are. <laughs> they share this international boat, okay, and this is, 10 minutes, okay. Uh, this boat is used, it's an international collaboration, and they go out and they drill under the sea floor, and they take these cores back. And th so this is a library, it's a library of cores, and it's frozen cores. This is actually in uh, Texas A&M University. There's three of them around the world. There's a Japanese one, a European one, an American one, and they're roughly divided up by different oceans, okay. So bear that one in mind. Now, here's what happens. Ours are microbiologists. They're trying to get data off what was really intended for physical science, and it took them until the 1960s to get, to get seats on board this ship, very precious seats. They go out for you know, a month or more at a time. Uh, there's much more capability to do the physical science characterization on board the ship than the uh, microbiological sciences. For, and some of you have clearly studied some of these areas. Uh, to do physical science from those cores that you just saw, you store them at minus four degrees centigrade. To do biological analyses, you store them at minus 80 centigrade. So the decision on board ship of what temperature you store it at determines what kind of science can ever be gotten again from those and they split them up, and half of the core goes into the freezer, the other half gets sliced up and belongs to the investigators. Uh, the third set of examples is then from astronomy. We've been working with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey for about 10 years now, and uh, they were designed as the first sky survey that was going to have their data open to everyone, including school children around the world. This is what Zooniverse, Galaxy Zoo, and others have been built on top of. Even some very interesting new wave music has been built, drawing from the data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, here, as a ground-based survey, they've had a very hard time getting uh, investment in keeping the data alive at the end of the scientific data collection. Even those, those data will have scientific value for at least another decade or two until there's other kinds of data from the next generation of surveys. Uh, but it's open, and just the whole notion of open data is hugely contentious, and we're writing some papers on it. But it's proprietary software done in a concert with Microsoft. The large synoptic survey, which follows after it, is also claiming to be open data, but op only open to its partners. And it's because you know, people have to pony up the money. There's a real economic free rider problem for those of you who follow uh, those. There's a real commons goods problem here. Uh, but they've gone for open source software. And their argument for open source software is that they can uh, get the community to keep the software going over a much longer period of time. So this is 
This is a question to be tested as, as time goes on, and our anthropologists are looking at that. But notice you've got something on the order of 50 years from the beginning of the conceptualization of a project through, through the second one. And you look at large facilities like the uh, European uh, spallation source being built here in Lund, you've got these 50-year kinds of timescales. So predicting the science, predicting the technology, predicting the funding paths over those periods of time is a hugely difficult, interdisciplinary, data-driven, technological, sociological, institutional, economic, you name it, uh, kind of problem. One of the groups we're working with in astronomy is based at UCLA, and the Keck Observatory is one of the great private telescopes. Now, it's open, it's open to a certain degree to other partners, but it's, it's funded by the, the Keck Foundation and University of California and Caltech uh, operate it. Uh, and the group that we've been working with started collecting their data on the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy in about 1995, which was 10 years before Keck even had a data archive to go with it, which meant that they had to do all of their own data archiving, and this is time-based astronomy, which is even harder to capture the data and store than the kinds of things coming off the survey telescopes. But this, uh, this group we're working with, the Galactic Center Group, has somehow managed to keep their data alive for uh, you know, going on 25 years already. But they're, they're hitting you know, change points in uh, getting larger, the data scaling up, the collaboration scaling up, and uh, we have a dissertation underway on just the whole notion of how you keep data alive. And astronomy may look like one field, but it's actually a field with many, many different specialties to it. And each of these surveys has a different set of science questions, so it's, it's interdisciplinary in, in some other ways. So one of the responses, and, and the very popular one right now, is these FAIR principles, to make data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. This came more out of the biomedical community, but it's been adopted very broadly and across, um, uh, in fact, Europe is one of the founding areas of the FAIR principles. We had a presentation on this yesterday as well. Now, this is a largely a move away from thinking about journal articles as just flat PDFs that uh, humans are going to read and thinking of them much more as mineable kinds of text. Particularly in biomedicine, they view the journal article as containers of data they want to unpack. If you take a data set and you flatten it out into a PDF file, you basically destroy the data. It's no longer structured data. And we want to treat journal articles, data sets, everything else as mineable data, send our robots out. So that's where we're trying to go with this, uh, which opens up just every question about what are data, what's a data set, what's a journal article, and so on. And this is an interesting area to follow. Um, that's a wonderful idea, but here's the reality on the ground, is the rarely, uh, except in the very large collaborations, do you have real data scientists, data managers, records managers who are part of these projects? In the big astronomy you do, and there's a little bit of it in the CDB, uh, our team was the only thing along that lines in the 10 years of, of the Center for Embedded Network Sensing. Uh, but something like uh, LSST, half of that billion dollar project is going to data management, almost none of SENS and very little of CDB has gone to data management. And what, so the data management gets done by the graduate students and the postdocs. And that's, you know, it's time, undervalued time, that's absolutely essential to get the science done. It's invisible work. Uh, that's important to keep it together. Uh, if only we had something like, you know, it's plugging the Ethernet cable into the cloud here, I uh, bet that's unfortunately the way it doesn't work. It works, and a cl the cloud is really just containers full of racks of computers anyway. It's, it's not off there someplace. It's just as much spinning disks, disks as everything else. So let me um, finish with just this set of challenges and this is a set of dimensions that you know, we're still thinking about, and I kind of set up in, in the book that came out three years ago, is that 
using data or reusing data is difficult even when you've got people in the same room who work together to collect it. As soon as you get collaborators who are any dis distance away in time, in space, and discipline, it gets gradually harder to make sense of those data and share them. But what we're really talking about with, the, with FAIR principles and those uh, funding agency policies is to think about data being reused over very long periods of time by people who had nothing to do with the original project, who come from completely different disciplines, I mean, if you think about the climate change work and how old diaries of things like when flowers bloomed in the 19th century are turning into absolutely critical data, you know, keeping track of these is the ultimate challenge. So it's sort of, you know, start here and span outwards, and the more variables you add in, the more challenging the whole process becomes. So I hope that gives you a few more things to think about in the interdisciplinary environment. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes? Per Rudinesson, I'm head of computer science department here at Lund. And I, uh, I saw the notes on open source software. Uh, have you seen any any place, and that's that's the core of my my research interest. Have you seen any place where the open source community, as such, can be kind of a focal point for the interdisciplinary research, or is that too distant from from the dif different disciplines involved in in the research? Ah. Okay, that's a, that's a very interesting question. I mean, it would certainly make sense to have that more of a focal point and. Uh, uh, Bernadette Bosco, one of the, the students who's the one working on the, the data aliveness, uh, is a real Python and uh, Jupyter Notebook person. She's gone to a number of those workshops and the Force 11 workshops. What we find is that uh, the scientists who come to those are ones who are really on that bleeding edge of interests, of building the new tools. They're the ones who sort of live on GitHub, and, and, and that's their world. But they're not, and they're often the younger ones, although not entirely, but they're certainly not your mainstream scientists. Uh, I mean, that would be a place to do it. But open source software, as you probably know, is itself a, an area of considerable interest in science technology studies. My colleague, Chris Kelty, at, in my, who's half my department, half anthropology at UCLA, has done a very good book on that, and there's much more work since. No, that would be nice. And see, astronomy, there's these several kind of astronomy hacker communities where people come together to build new tools and build the notebooks and, and, uh, and so on. But they're not, they're not the mainstream, I think it's probably fair to say, Melvin, of, of astronomy. But it, it's a nexus that I think we're very interested in looking at. Yes. Uh, I came to think about an excellent paper called, um, with the title, Doing Without Data. Have you Do read it? Doing Without Data. Do to, doing Without Data. <laughs> I, I need uh, that paper. By okay. a Danish uh, psychology, I think, Sven Brinkman. Uh, it's an excellent paper. He, uh, he got the inspiration when talking to his colleagues, who all of them, were quantitative scientists mm -hmm. uh, during coffee breaks, and he, he said that they always complained about, about data. They have either too much, or it, it's the wrong data, or something's wrong with the data. So he provoked them and said, why don't you do without data? Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, is there, is there a risk that this obsession with data um, makes us look, uh, we, we follow this uh, streetlight search mm -hmm. syndrome, <laughs> right. that we look for the key under streetlight, not where we dropped it because mm -hmm. it's dark there. Is, it, is there a risk that we look for problems where there is data and we actually um, shy away from, from perhaps very important problems mm -hmm. because they are so hard mm -hmm. to study because, that, because there is no data? Right. You see such a risk? Yes, excellent question. 
you notice I titled the book Big Data, Little Data, No Data. Okay. And uh, you know, no data is, is more of a, a coin that, that I term for that purpose to say, you know, what happens when you have no data or you think you have no data or the data have gone away. And you know, unless you really invest in keeping the data, the data go away and data, no data is actually the, the default condition because the data have, have disappeared. Uh, we find, uh, for example, the, the theorists in astronomy, some of them will tell you they have data and some of them t will tell you they have no data at all. Some people in LSST, which has not had first light yet, will tell you they have no data. And others will tell you they have lots of data because they're taking you know, data from Sloan and other places to calibrate the instruments. And you get this whole cycle where you've got to have data from one generation of science to generate the models to produce the predictions for what you might see that helps design the next one down. It becomes an infinite regress. You know, th there's, no, there's no beginning to this process. And that's also hard to argue with. Uh, let me make one other point, though, is, is a, a different one, which is the danger of bibliometrics, which is also an area that, that we study, is people love numbers and the amount of trust in those bibli bibliometric numbers is absolutely terrifying. And I would... Um, the number of administrators who are willing to make decisions about hiring and promotion based on bibliometrics who could actually define an impact factor and tell you how it's measured is probably very small. How many of you know what field in which the original impact factor comes from? Physics. And what does it mean? What is, what is the ratio and impact factor? All of you are li looking at, at H indexes and such every single day. How many of you can tell me what the ratio is? Uh, the journal impact factor. It's two years because it's from physics. Okay. So if you take the number of articles published in 2015 and how many of them were cited by 2017. Okay, which is a, a narrow window that only makes sense in very very small number of high uh, in, you know, of high moving fields, and then the journals themselves will manipulate what is an article versus what is a news item and so on to you know to tweak that fa to tweak that factor, uh, and if you look at the numbers in Google Scholar, you look at the numbers in Scopus, you look at the numbers in Web of Science, you will get um, a ratio of say at least double depending on what the field is. Okay. And we also know that paper, the citations of individual papers are highly unevenly distributed from one uh, within a journal. So then the journal impact factor gets used as surrogate for the value of the paper and yet the paper may be very low cited and you've got one highly skewed paper, which may be skewed because it has, you know, was retracted and false, and yet that skews it in that direction. Okay. So it's this use of numbers because they are numbers that don't meet some of the most basic principles of validity and reliability in any field, but people love numbers, is I, I find particularly scary in this area. A question in the back. It's being recorded, so. Uh, thank you. Yeah, Chad Bode is my name from Luxus. Uh, I was just curious about the experience you've had in working with qualitative data and the storing and sharing mm -hmm. of that. And I was kind of inspired to ask the question based on what I found to be super interesting in your presentation about the, the possibility of the physical samples degrading whether or not they're stored a certain way or not. Mm -hmm. But in the social sciences, often qualitative methods, there's the collection of kind of interpretations of interpretations and right. how that gets stored and what your experiences mm -hmm. uh, have been in, in dealing with that. Again, our group is unusual in that uh, I've got 15 years worth of qualitative data of interviewing and observing different science groups over time. And you know, arguably, we have the biggest data set over the longest period of time, over the most different disciplines, 
of anyone. And what we're doing now is going back and trying to compare across them. Because e in each study, we have had certain common questions about you know, things like, like what are your data and you know, what do you do with them and where they come from and so on. Then there's, with each specific s study and each specific discipline, there, there's other ones. And the students in my group, you know, we don't touch their data you know, until they're do done with, the, with their degree and then their data go in the pool for the rest of us to keep mining. Um, I've just hired last fall a, an, an anthropologist who did his uh, doctoral dissertation studying a do-it-yourself biology lab in Silicon Valley. Uh, to come in and help us compare across those because I really wanted somebody who had not been involved in all this data collection to take a fresh look at it. So we're now trying to do that invisible work and Michael Scroggins is already well underway on a very interesting model of invisible work and just the kinds of invisible work that have been involved in the data collection handling over time. And we've also promised the Sloan Foundation uh, several methodological papers and how we've managed to keep this continuity over time. And they, they specifically asked us for those. But at the same time, of course, it's all completely under human subjects and we can't release the full transcripts or the recordings because we, we have them, uh, we've had the money to take those and offshore them. So we have complete transcripts of all of the recordings many, many hours of, of recordings as well. So it's a great trove, uh, and I wish I could release it, but I have yet to find a way that I could release it. And even though things like interviews with astronomers might sound innocuous, it's amazing what they will say about each other <laughs> <laughs> after a while. And um, we, we, we know things that, that we, we would never want to share with anyone else. Uh, and be, you know, it, it is sensitive, and you, know, you, you get people's trust and you build up ideas, and, and there's things like, uh, Melvin well knows, the virtual observatory is a very, a very controversial topic, and we've, uh, we've not been able to write it up because we can't just figure, we have yet to figure out how we can write it in a way that enough, the whole community will still speak to us, uh, because it's, it's gotta be very delicately handled about the different kinds of controversies that have occurred over time and as it's, as it's changed um, internationally. So it's, uh, it's been fascinating work. Another question back here. I'm a chemist and, and one big data base or handling of big data that works very well in my experience is the protein database mm -hmm. where you deposit the protein structures and then you can retract them and do all kinds of things with them. I mean, why, is it known why it works so well? I mean, is it a common standard or can you learn something from the way it's set up to other uh, big uh, database? Uh, well, okay, the protein data bank has been, uh, has been well studied and there's a number of people in biology and science technology studies who have looked at that. Um, and so I'll, I'll give you sort of a, a high level view because it's not something I know as well as others which is uh, you've got a very long history of, of data sharing you know, in, in proteins. And so you've got, you've got the Protein Bank and Swiss Prod and the other ones. And you've had international collaboration of funding agencies and scientists. You've also got the early days of the Human Genome Project when, was it Craig Venter tried to, Venter, Ventner, tried to take the genome private and patent genomes from the start. And then there was a real, uh, you know, a real firestorm that says no one should be able to own genomes. And the big pushback was to make them open and there was a big international fight about it and the outcome was to make them open and then the scientists really invested in keeping, in keeping them open. Does that sound like a reasonable story? Okay. That's the sort of story for, that we get from all the places. But not, you know, but not without contention because you've, you know, every year, two years, five years, somebody's got to go for a new grant to keep each of these databases going. And in the U.S., the National Institutes of Health has been the major funder and supporter of these. And even the National Institutes of Health is saying, you know, this is scaling beyond even what we can afford. And we're not sure that we're going to be able to keep being 
the big database place and maybe individual universities have to keep their own and have a more distributed model. So, you know, this is a, a constant negotiation, but it's, I think it's a, the, uh, the protein data banks, the Human Genome Project are a very important part of science history and, and data history that many other fields have tried to learn from. We only have time for one more short question. Michael. The, the, the stories that you've told um, tend to at least focus on the higher level sort of um, institutional or broadly you know, almost multinational structures that are in place to support data sharing and reuse. But you've also spent a lot of time with individuals, like right. interviewing people. Yeah. And I'm curious um, what you have learned about person or individual characteristics that support um, or are predictive maybe of people who would be really excited about sharing data and, and or reusing data. Is, is that does that come out in the work that you do? Like, are there um, in ways in which individuals function who like certain types of individuals who are more inclined to share their data than other types of individuals? Do you mm. do you have you arrived at any conclusions at that level yeah. about um, data sharing and reuse? Well, I mean, our work is really with you know with individuals. I'm, I'm more abstracting because of the you know the nature of today's today's conversation. I wouldn't say it's it's hard to say. You certainly get some people more, and it's probably kind of a bimodal distribution. You've got uh, you know you've got certain young people who want to build the coolest, best new tools. And they think that science should be done completely in the open. They're building their, Ju their Jupyter notebooks. They're you know, building collaboratively with their friends. And yet, at the same time, the junior people often have the most to lose if they get scooped. Okay. So it's, it's not entirely clear. Then you've got your senior people, uh, like Alex Zale, who's one of the leaders of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, who want to invest their careers, and people are willing to invest in these long-term missions, are you know a class into themselves because it you know could be 10 years before they see any data, and you know the mission might not get funded. Things happen, dissertations die on on some of these missions, but they're really committed to advancing the science, and this is where you know where Alex, who we know well, uh, has come in. And the, the, it's also a difference in field. So things like the, the protein data bank, where you've got a kind of science that needs large, comparative, integrative kinds of data sources, where astronomy is one, as uh, George Agofsky of Caltech says, things go bang in the night. And more things go bang in the night than they can follow up. So maybe a thousand things go bang in the night in his Catalina Sky Survey, and there aren't a thousand grad students to follow them up. In the next surveys, it's going to be ten ten thousand things go bang in the night from a LSST, and if you throw it open. Then you've got undergrads and high school kids, and, and high school kids and school teachers have made important discoveries in astronomy by just mining these databases when nobody else had the time to do it. So it's, a, it's often the kind of science of throwing it open means more people can come help, help us do the science. But then there's areas within astronomy, including some that we talked to here a couple days ago, that are scarce. So just because astronomy says big data doesn't mean everybody has big data. There's some kinds of uh, some kinds of data collection that are smaller sets, more intensive, very hard won, and particularly the people who build their own instruments. And you know, if you built that instrument and it's your kind of data, that's not data you're going to give away very readily either. So we have to be very careful about generalizing even from field to field. Okay. So. Thank you. Thank you very much.